Hi everyone, my name is Jacob and I will be giving you a quick overview of our recent work regarding the path towards ultra-low latency millimeter wave Wi-Fi for multi-user interactive virtual reality. So let's start with the last part, with the virtual reality part. I'm sure you're mostly familiar with uh, a number of recently introduced virtual reality headsets such as these four. Now you'll notice on these carefully chosen promotional images that all of them feature a wire. Actually, most of the commercially available headsets are wired solutions. However, some exceptions exist, such as the HTC Vive, where a, an extension piece can be bought to turn this into a wireless headset. And perhaps more interestingly, um, the recently introduced line of Oculus Quest headsets uh, has a system on a chip inside, which means that it's a fully wireless device. However, there's also a cable on the market that turns it into a regular wired device connected to a strong PC. And one final more uh, recent introduction on the market I want to cover is this relativity device, which is a build-it-yourself device where using off-the-shelf components, you can build your own virtual reality headset. And for this, it would be interesting if we could turn this into a wireless solution using some type of Wi-Fi chip that could be integrated into the headset. And we want to look at what's the optimal type of Wi-Fi chip that we should put in there so that your system works very well. To answer that question, we need to look at motion to photon latency. This is a very well-known concept in the virtual reality world. Uh, which determines how long it takes after a user performs a motion to have the effects of that motion shown on screen. For this, a whole process needs to happen. First of all, the headset needs to detect this motion. Then this information needs to be transmitted wirelessly in this case to a server. And on this server, a new image must be generated to be shown on the headset. Then this new entire image needs to be transmitted wirelessly again towards the headsets and finally the headset needs to of course update its screens to show this new image. Now this whole process needs to be finished consistently within 20 milliseconds in order to not nauseate the user which means that for the uh, wireless transmission part a good estimate of how long this is allowed to take is one to five milliseconds because all of the other steps in this process also take some time. Now, in order to achieve these MTP requirements, we need to transmit a whole lot of data very quickly, which means that first of all, your network needs to be low latency, but perhaps more importantly, your network needs to be very high throughput. So why is high throughput so important for this system? Well. Consider this illustration uh, where the blue boxes indicate how much time there is to transmit a video frame within the latency bounds. You can see that it's only a small part of the full throughput that is available in the network, which means that given some network throughput, the possible video throughput in megabits per second that can be offered uh, to the system is actually a lot lower. But this also has an inherent advantage, namely that a single access point can serve multiple headsets simply by interleaving the traffic intended for all different headsets as illustrated here. So going back to this slide, there's a clear best choice of Wi-Fi chip, namely to have off-the-shelf millimeter wave Wi-Fi networking, which means you're going to the standards of IEEE 802.11 AD and AY. So a quick crash course on these standards for anyone not familiar with it. These are two separate standards, the former of which was finalized about eight years ago, the latter of which may or may not have been finalized by the time you're watching this video. Um, both of these operate in the millimeter wave band, which is roughly 60 to 70 gigahertz. And in this band, you suffer from very high path loss and very low penetration capability, which means that your signal must be beamformed beam towards the receiver. Uh, now, specifically in these chips, this is implemented through a sectoring system, which means that a number of sectors have been predefined, and these are just directions in which the access point can send. One final note on this is that 802.11 AY 
is not a reinvention but rather an extension of uh, 11 AD which means that our that this work being presented here which is on AD will also be easily extensible to 11 AY in the future so let's have a closer look at 802.11 AD specifically at the beacon interval um, this is a, a two-part interval which consists of the beacon header interval and the data transmission interval starting with the beacon header interval that's where uh, all control traffic and signaling occurs. It's a three-part interval consisting in the first place of the beacon transmission interval, which is where beacons containing uh, general information are sent sector per sector to all of the stations in the network. Um, a beacon must be sent at least once every fourth beacon interval to each, to each single sector. Then second, we have the association beamforming training step which is a uh, contention-based slotted interval during which stations can attempt to associate with the network. And this must occur at least once every 15th beacon interval. And then finally, there's the announcement transmission interval, which we're not going to go into now because it's optional and usually turned off. So how long does such a beacon header interval take? Well. Looking at a simple eight sector access point with default settings, this already takes 1.664 milliseconds, which is too high to get to millisecond latency. But if we tweak the settings a bit to get it as short as possible, we can actually get it down to just a fourth of a millisecond, which is a lot better. Then the second part of the beacon interval is the data transmission interval where uh, stations can communicate. This interval can be filled with a number of access periods. Uh, they are divided into two different types. First of all, there's a contention-based access period during which uh, any station can send. First, they have to listen if the network is free, then they have to wait for a randomly determined backup period, and then they can finally send. The other option is the service periods, which are predefined by the access point. And during a service period, only a single station can send only to a specific predefined receiver. Now there are two subtypes of the service period. One is predefined during the beacon transmission interval and one is uh, assigned more dynamically during the data transmission interval and we will consider both. That being said, we're going to look at the overheads that each of these channel access methods induce. First of all, there's the contention-based system. Um, before you can actually send your data, you have to wait for the start of the next slot, which will take upwards of five microseconds. And also technically before you can send, you also need to wait for a backup period of up to 23 microseconds. However, you can actually go through your backup phase before you have data available, which means as soon as data has been sent, we go through our backup uh, to be ready for the next piece of data to become available. So we put it at the end. Then second is the service period based system where there's no waiting time ahead of sending data but there is a guard time at the end of the data transmission now a guard time has to be defined between uh, consecutive periods so that if clocks drift between stations these periods will not overlap between different stations and no data collision will be caused that way then finally for the dynamic service periods there's again a guard time at the end However, there's now also, before you start sending data, a grant frame overhead because as these service periods are assigned dynamically, there is an, an overhead of actually performing this assignment. So how do we apply the system? Here we have a quick mock-up where we have a single access point mounted on the ceiling, uh, servicing a number of headsets on the ground. So uh, we're going to analyze the performance of the system. And to do that simply, we define the number of extractions, the most important of which is latency blocks, which is a channel access method agnostic way of presenting any type of latency that can occur in the system. Latency being any point at which you cannot transmit application data. We have defined three types of latency blocks. The first one being the inter-BI latency, so the inter-beacon interval latency. That's basically the latency induced because of the beacon header interval where a bunch of beacons are being transmitted. 
Second, we have the inter-VF latency, a VF being a video frame, so one single image uh, that's to be shown on the headset. This type of latency occurs between any two subsequent transmissions of such video, video frames, and this mainly covers guard times and backoffs. Then finally, we have the access latency, which occurs right before transmitting a video frame, and this mainly covers slotting and grand frame overheads, as mentioned. So I have a quick illustration of this, where the inter-BI latency occurs here, then we have inter-VF latency here and here, and the access latency is shown here in this little white part, because within the green block, which is when the video frame is available, only in the shaded part there is actual data transmission. And apart from that, we also define the number of synchronization assumptions, the first of which being a BI coordinated system, which means that the server scheduling video frames is aware of when the inter BI latency occurs and makes sure that the video frames do not overlap with this inter BI uh, latency block. Then, secondly, there's a video coordination system, which is a weaker version of BI coordination where the video frames themselves are still properly interleaved but there is no attempt to avoid the inter-BI block because you don't know when it will occur, which means that it may collide with the video frame and eat away at the available time for actually transmitting your video frame, which is shaded in green here. So what's the end goal of the system that we presented? Well, um, given some configuration of your system, you can uh, using formulas presented in the paper, calculate the length of all of these latency blocks and as a result also calculate the length of the shaded green part, which is where you can actually perform video frame transmission. So we want to compute the length of that. And given the length, we also want to convert this to available throughput to our, uh, to our headsets. Now in this table, we show some of the attainable throughputs that have been calculated by our framework for a setup with different types of synchronization assumptions, uh, different numbers of headsets and different latency bounds, all running at 120 frames per second. And in this, we see if we have a tightly coordinated system, so a BI coordinated system, the choice of your uh, channel access method doesn't matter very much for the attainable throughput. However, when we move to a less coordinated system, a only a video coordinated system, it actually becomes very important which type of uh, channel access method you use. For example, here you'll see that a port choice in a channel access method actually makes your final throughput six times lower than an optimal choice. So uh, we presented a bunch of calculations, but uh, now we actually want to check if these are accurate. So to do that, we implemented this whole system in the NS3 simulation and we, um, we set the throughputs to go to all the headsets uh, to what is computed by our framework to check if it's a proper estimate of the highest throughput uh, attainable. And if we look at it, the red lines are the latency bounds and then the other lines indicate the actual latencies achieved. We will see that in every single system our maximum latencies got very close to the maximum allowed latency, but we never went over it, which means that our framework um, actually provides very accurate estimates taking all types of overheads into account. So that's the overview of our framework, just to quickly sum it all up. Um, we looked at the maximum achievable headset performance in throughput in under uh, ideal channel conditions using only a single access point. What we can see then is um, we can achieve a system where we have eight headsets being served at at most one millisecond of latency. And depending on the synchronization assumptions, we can achieve uh, this with either 2K or 4K displays for each eye for each virtual reality headset. Now, if you want to extend this to 8K displays, which are not currently available on the market, um, 11 AD can only do this at a five millisecond latency. If you want to lower that latency bound, you will have to look at 11 AY systems, which is currently future work for us, along with looking at suboptimal channel conditions, 
and situations where their signal blockage or users are moving. Thank you very much.